The 26th of September gave us a European North American double bill as Italy played Canada for the rights to claim the Pizza Pizza chain and the USA faced England, two sides looking for a good rugby resort to make them feel slightly better about their entirely imploding political situations. Canada faced Italy in Fukuoka, but after every play, fans and players alike never seemed to get beyond the first syllable of the town's name, as they put in an immensely frustrating performance. Italy played well, shooting out to a 17-point lead before defending solidly to contain a Canadian team who, in fairness, fought with some spirit. It started with this try from Bram Stain, who bumped off Canada's Peter Nelson, a man who wins the accolade of most Irish-looking player at this World Cup, thanks to France not picking Felix Lambay. Their back row continued to excel, as Sebastian Negri scored this try, and Jake Pelletri just battered off tacklers like they were members of the Canadian national rugby team, before Negri once again popped up and threw one of the best passes you'll see this tournament, putting Benini away in the corner. Canada also pulled one really impressive innovation in defence that I just want to focus on for a second. So, a lovely outside arc and offload by Campagnaro gets Italy away down the short side. Tyler Argon then makes the tackle and gets back up to his feet, and Canada set the defensive line as Italy play another phase. Now, look at the Canadian line here. They have one player tied into the ruck and two in the backfield, meaning Italy look up and see a 12-man Canadian defensive line. This is where the trigger comes in, because Italy are not facing... 12 defenders. They're facing one Tyler Ardron and a very advanced hologram system making it look like there are 14 other Canadian players on the pitch. Because these are just projections of light and not real humans, Italy are able to just walk right through them and over the try line. It's really impressive from Canada and definitely not shit because it's either that or Dean Budd is now Jonah Lomu. You know, there's, there's only two possibilities. Ardron was basically left playing by himself. He had a try chalked off, and look how well he does in this opportunity, readjusting after Minotzi reads it and drifts to the support. Ardron keeps holding the ball and waits until the three-foot marcher is committed, before throwing an offload that should put Matt Heaton under the posts. But instead, Heaton shows the world why he plays for Darlington in the third tier of English rugby. The USA was slightly less frustrating, but not much better, unfortunately. It was the kind of performance from the States where you can't blame John Quill for getting to the last 10 minutes and thinking, well, nothing's going our way, I might as well just twat Owen Farrell in the face. Unlike the Tonga game, Eddie Jones clearly had a game plan to deal with the USA, and it was very effective. Jones went into the game knowing the USA are a solid team with a handful of standout players, and all he had to do was cancel out those threats and then tire out the rest of the team. So he picked strong enough set piece operators to negate the likes of Lamastelli and Tafete. Piers Francis took out fullback Big Will Hooley in the first minute, which left really the only key player on the pitch he had to deal with, AJ McGinty. So England constantly pinned the USA in this particular corner. Now, McGinty is very, very right-footed, and that makes this a very difficult angle for him to hit. So instead of using their one properly international class kicker to clear, they were forced to leave most of the booting to bash up boy Paul C.K. and scrum half Sean Davies, who, incidentally, it was pointed out to me, looks a bit like a bald Peter Dinklage. This limited the distance the USA could get on their clearances, meaning they just had to keep handing England the ball back around the 22 metre mark. It was very simple, but it gave England an absolute monopoly of territory and the vast majority of possession. They then did the typical tier 1 v tier 2 thing of just battering away at them until the USA made so many tackles they're always going to start to fall off them. I'm actually pretty impressed by how well their defence the Maul aside held out in the first half considering how much of it they had to do against a team of really classy players. I don't mean to be patronising, I genuinely think they were far better than people can credit for, but in the end they were never really going to get a win who had them pretty solidly clocked and outclassed. It was nice however to see the USA eventually scored this try as they capitalised on a passage of play that seemed to resemble two teams of otters trying to play sevens. I think this USA team is better than it's showing and I'll be really interested to see where they go, but this England team is slowly getting better and we need to keep an eye on how they step up against Argentina as Jones begins to play the cards he has in his hand to secure a decent draw come the quarterfinals. So there's a lot of work to do for the North American teams, but hey, you know, at least we didn't need to read a tweet from Donald Trump in all caps congratulating the USA Eagles on a win. For both of them, from here, the only way is up. Well, it's either up or playing the All Blacks, you know, one of the two. Hello, thank you for watching that. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you thought that was good. I'm trying to catch up with as many games as possible and move through them as quickly as possible. I'm currently in Kyoto, which is obviously quite a holy space. Uh, a lot of temples, lots of shrines, uh, lots of I say, holy sites. So I just have to do a bit of pilgrimage and visit somewhere important to me for exactly those reasons. Um, and I'm currently sitting in front of the Nintendo development building um, and there's something really quite moving about standing there and thinking that building behind me is where 
most of my favourite games that meant so much to me over the course of my life were made. I walked by as a lot of developers were going out on their lunch break and there was something really moving about thinking, actually, at least one of those guys probably worked on Breath of the Wild, at least one of them probably made something really important to me. I think it's the best game I've ever played, but that's an aside. Um, I'm going to go back to different kind of games, rug rugby, um, and I'll see you very soon for more rugby when I talk about rugby and try and get over the fact that that's actually just behind me. That's an actual building. It's an actual building where they actually made all of those. It's actually kind of overwhelming. Um, I almost cried.